Waters grew up in Chicago in a violent poverty stricken environment. He developed a strong spirit of entrepreneurism as a mechanism to change his circumstances. Dropping out of high school, Waters entered the labor force at a young age. During this period of transformation in his life, a tragic incident left him paralyzed. A strong spirit of faith and entrepreneurism is what he utilized to live with his paralysis and recovery that followed, and eventually be, uh, begin the process of reaching his dreams. Having earned his GED and associate's degree from Tulsa Community College, a bachelor's degree from Oklahoma State University, and in commodities trading advisor registration from the National Future, Futures Association, also numerous for the philanthropic awards, Waters now works as an accountant for the Williams Companies as an, as a, and is an adjunct professor for the OSU Entrepreneurs Program. Also, he is building a global venture capital private equity firm. By telling his story and speaking about entrepreneurship and overcoming adversity, Waters wants to have a positive influence on others, to share how he makes the choice every day to be eternally optimistic and how he maintains an entrepreneurial spirit despite all of his conditions. Let's welcome A. Waters. I, uh, I thank you so much for coming down. Nate, Nate lives up in Tulsa, and he um, he's uh, perhaps the most courageous person I've ever met in my life. Um, and uh, uh, a dangerous guy when you, when you have a few beers. <laughs> It doesn't matter. I love you, man. Anyway, Nate uh, is is uh, is going to take a, a journey with us. We're going to take a journey with him, actually. Um, and I'm asking a series of questions, and, and, and I want you to just reflect on what he shares with us. So, Nate, uh, you're born in Chicago. Yep, yeah, South South Chicago. And um, that would have been when? Uh, 1978. 1978. Yes. And did you, uh, so you're a young kid in Chicago and um, living in the south, south side? Yeah, in the slums. In the slums? Tough, tough area? Very tough. And, and uh, you never really knew your dad. Well, he died when I was three years old with esophageal cancer. He was uh, 50 years older than my mother, so when I was on my way into the world, he was on his way out of the world. So you, did you know him at all, or do you remember him at all? Um, very little, because he died when I was three, so yeah. I had a real bright memory of that. So, uh, did your mom have a job? No, she didn't. She didn't have a job. So how did you get by? Well, um, you know, I started collecting cans, shining shoes, delivering newspapers, turning extra cash at the age of seven years old. And uh, you know, that was really, that really gave me my, I guess, you know, my, I guess, uh, self-worth being an entrepreneur at that age. Earning more money, not depending on mom or anyone else for financial assistance. So, you're an entrepreneur from, from the get-go? Yes. Because you had to be. You have no choice. But well, you I guess I did. Love, you? Yeah, so I, I guess I did have a choice. I could have, you know, basically not, not you know, done anything. But at home, my environment wasn't too nurturing. And at school, I was ridiculed and picked on a lot. And uh, very funny looking kid. And uh, so, you know, uh, a guy that was like four years older than me started collecting cans for like 25 cents a pound. And uh, he was making some pretty good money at it. And he was shining shoes and doing things like that. And so I want to start doing the same thing. And uh, he showed me basically, he, he kind of showed me where the cans were, where I could get the cans at, and things of that sort. And from that point on, I just kind of took it and ran with it. And then it really became a large part of me. It really kept me away from the gangs and kept me out of a lot of negative situations that I could have been involved with in Chicago. So it became a large part of my life. 
So what were all the other kids in school doing? Well, a lot of them were robbing uh, stores, uh, selling drugs, uh, you know, packing guns. You know, uh, then you had a, quite a few of them that was dependent on their mom and dad to give them money for allowance at seven and eight years old, nine years old. And, you know, I wasn't, I, I was pretty much independent. I earned my own money, so I didn't need no one to, to help buy my clothes or shoes, anything like that. I actually helped my mom pay her own, her own rent. So, so I guess at seven, I was, you know, doing a lot. So how were things at home in those days? Well, uh, my mom was abusive, you know. Um, you know, she was abused as a child, so the cycle of child abuse was pretty dominant in my life. Um, my mom had different boyfriends, and they would abuse me and my sister. You know, physically abuse us and psychologically abuse us also. So uh, the household was pretty wild, very chaotic. And, uh, but we thought it was normal. I mean, when you grow up in that type of environment, you don't think anything else is, uh, you know, wrong. You don't think anything is wrong with it. But entrepreneurship, to me, became uh, an avenue for me to, I guess, take out all of my energies and, and emotions and, and put just about, I basically you know, poured my life into being able to get out and deliver papers for Chicago sometimes, Chicago Tribune, uh, pump gas at the Amico gas station, and uh, clean windows at different um, Italian restaurants and things like that. So that, that became all of me, really. So basically, I would, my mom would wake me up at 5.30 to, to wake me up to deliver newspapers for the Washington Park branch. And then when I got home after school, I would leave home. After I do my homework, I would walk up and down Second Third and Cottage Grove and uh, mop floors at, at different uh, restaurants. You stayed in school? Yes, yeah, stayed in school during the whole time, yes. So, so you're getting ridiculed and beat up at school. Yeah. You're not getting any self reinforcement. No. So that, that at all. Your entrepreneurial ventures actually were your source of worth and yes. identity. Yes. It was my life. Really. That was my first love. You know. Uh, then, well, I was too skinny for football, too uncoordinated for basketball, so I couldn't play any sports and nothing like that. And, and we st and I stayed in the city with Chicago Bulls and Chicago Bears. They were doing pretty good back then. Um, but you know, entrepreneurship was basically my main interest. I wasn't into video games and nothing like that because a lot of a lot of my peers had Nintendo, Atari, and Sega, and, and um, you know, I decided that I worked too hard for my money to spend a hundred dollars on a game system. You know, so um, entrepreneurship that, that that was that was basically my hope. That's all I wanted to you know. That was like that was, that was a lifestyle for me, really. You know. So. Uh, is there a drug use happening at home? Yeah, um, you know, crack cocaine, you know, mom, and, and she had different friends that, you know, different boyfriends that were out there in the streets pretty heavy, and um, so mom and her different boyfriends, you know, got involved with that. So if we stop the story right here, Nate, it's a pretty amazing success story, given what you're surrounded by, what you're dealing with from a very young age. Yes. And suddenly there's a family move. Yes, my aunt, who was originally from, who has since passed away, she's originally from Tulsa, Oklahoma. And she convinced my mom, sister, and I to relocate in Oklahoma. And um, initially, I was very hesitant about that. But my aunt, she was very persuasive, very persuasive. And so in 91, she picked us up in, in a U-Haul van and drove us back here to Tulsa. As soon as I arrived in Tulsa, I was like, well, I'm going to be a millionaire because there was so, many, so much grass. It's like in green country. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, everybody had a front and back yard. Everybody had trees in their, house, you know, in their yard and everything. And not South Chicago. No, not South Chicago. Not concrete, you know, jungle. It was basically, it was there, everything kind of spread out, you know. And my aunt told me one thing. She, she was standing in uh, kind of, uh, it was, uh, I guess, a little tough part of Tulsa, North Tulsa. And uh, she said, well, you need to be careful uh, walking around out here. And I didn't believe her because everyone lived in a house. Everyone had a car in their front yard, a dog, and you know, front and back yards. I'm thinking, well, this is not the projects. Everybody's rich. You know, so that's not even how anyone who lived in a house was very rich. Because living in, down, you know, in the inner city of Chicago was like, you know, with apartment buildings. 
you know, living in houses like three hundred thousand dollars, you know, and, and here we here are here we are in Tulsa, and it's just like totally different. And so I started um, mowing yards. I started mowing yards like thirty dollars for front and back yards. That's pretty cheap because they had you know some pretty big yards. <laughs> so immediately I um, put on entrepreneurship thinking cap and got busy. And then you got involved in some other ventures. Right? Yes, and I, you're in high school now. I, I, I was uh, my first. When I first moved, I was in my eighth grade year of middle school. So basically, I uh, I had me a lawn, a lawn, lawn, I'm sorry, landscaping route, and also I owned the vending machine route because you know I, I knew that everybody loved candy. So you know, being able to you know have someone throw those quarters and buy those gumballs, that you know those quarters add up. I mean, one or two may not mean a lot, but a hundred quarters that's that's some money right there. And so I started doing that. I also started up selling candy bars door to door. And I was also doing record promotions for a record company out of California. Then I was selling t shirts also, all while going to school. So from middle school, from my eighth grade year to ninth grade, tenth grade year, that's basically you know, what my life consisted of was entrepreneurship and endeav entrepreneurial endeavors. Um, my dream was to save up enough money to buy real estate. And uh, because I was so fascinated by the big buildings in Chicago, you know, the high rise, Sears Tower, John Hancock, and, and all those condominiums and everything like that. I used to always fantasize about owning those big buildings. And so um, I knew that it would be difficult selling candy to, to, own, to own real estate. So I wanted to be, a, I wanted to get involved in the music business. Because I, I really couldn't sing or write anything like that, write a song with us. But I said, well, uh, when you watch TV, nobody else can do it either. So, you know, all these uh, untalented individuals that's on television. So I said, okay, well, I might as well get involved with this and save up some money to buy some real estate. So yeah, that was what I was thinking about doing those years. So have things gotten better at your house? Or? No, no, uh, it actually got worse. Um, as I became older, I uh, lost uh, respect for my mom and her boyfriends and stuff like that. And, you know, it, it was just kind of a, it was, it, it wasn't a very nurturing environment. You know, I still love my mom, even to this day, um, but um, things, you know, got a little bit difficult because I would get into fights with my mother's boyfriends and everything, and because, you know, they felt like that I was supposed to, you know, obey them, and here they are, they're unemployed, and, you know, leeching off my mom, and I always had a job, I was very industrious, and they felt like they were too good to, to work with me, so. They were just kind of like bums, and so I didn't appreciate that. And so we would get into fights, you know, pretty often. And around that, drugs involved. Yeah, drugs and alcohol. And the thing also, um, when I was 16, I pretty much, you know, started hanging around the wrong crowd, uh, hanging around gang members and people that like to commit crimes and things of that sort. And so I ended up dropping out of school when I was uh, 16 years old. You dropped out of high school. Yes. Yes. So now we're entering another stage. You're, you're, you're getting in trouble, but you're still doing. Well, I'm still doing entrepreneurship endeavors. Basically, you know, at this time, I'm uh, having a little small car wash business where I would detail people's cars, and I still work at different, you know, menial jobs, different restaurants, uh, groundskeeping. So I always had like some type of legitimate job going. But my dream was to, you know, be a music, a music star, where I could have enough money to buy real estate. So those are the things that I, would, that I was involved in. Um, however, I guess, you know, for, I guess from 16, 17, 18, I kind of outgrew um, hanging out in the streets and stuff like that. And so I started work. I was a groundskeeper at a condominium complex. And I was, you know, saving enough money to try to move to California because I wanted to be a superstar. By this, I really wanted to be a superstar. I wanted to own real estate. But I said, okay, well, I need to make money somehow. So. But I didn't have any uh, any guy, not any mentors, anyone like that that you know kind of you know helped me along the way. But I just kind of you know thought I was going for what I figured would be the best uh, route for me to go. So you got this pretty terrible home situation, although you still don't totally understand how terrible it is. It's right. Kind of normal. Right. Uh, so you learn to sort of. Deal with her, like I've been fighting boyfriends more. Right. You, you got a tenth grade education. You dropped out of school. Yeah. Uh, you still got dreams, but then it all comes crashing down. What happened?
happened uh, April, April the 18th of 1997, I got into a fight with, with my mother's boyfriend. And uh, it's basically just kind of a, um, it, it started off as an argument. I was, you know, I came in, uh, took a shower, sat on the living room couch. And we stayed in a two bedroom apartment. And my sister had a bedroom, mom had a bedroom, and I slept on the living room couch. And so I'm watching television. This is Thursday night, just before the picking of my paycheck, Friday. And uh, my mom's boyfriend comes out the uh, bedroom and tells me it's time for me to go to sleep. And uh, here I'm, I'm peaceful, I'm watching television, just kind of you know, relaxing. And here he is, come out the bedroom telling me it's time for me to go to sleep and cut the lights off. And so I, you know, I, I immediately you know, get real pissed off and so I hop in his face and uh, we start arguing back and forth. And uh, we get into a fight. Uh, you know, this is kind of one of many fights that we've gotten into. Um, but, you know, I guess food before that fight, he pulled a gun out on me, gun to kill me, and beat up my sister. So, so it was a lot of hostility. Uh, then, like I said, I had respect for him and my mom. And uh, he, I basically swung and uh, hit him, and uh, he overpowered me, picked me up, and body stabbed me on my head, and uh, broke my neck and uh, five and broke my neck, uh, fourth, fifth, and sixth vertebrae in my neck, and just left me there for dead. So you're laying on the floor. He goes to bed. Yeah, yeah. Him and my mom, he goes back to the bedroom and they back watching TV, drinking, smoking crack, you know, doing whatever. And I'm you're laying. Paralyzed. Yeah, I'm, I didn't know I was paralyzed. So I'm laying face down on, in the middle of the living room floor. And the apartment was kind of like a hotel room, a small apartment. So here I'm in the middle of the living room floor. And you, you couldn't miss me. And uh, I'm turning my head back and forth face down on the carpet, because I didn't have any idea you know, how it feels to be paralyzed. I just knew I couldn't move. So here I am, face down on the carpet, turning my head back and forth like this. And this whole, over a 12 hour period. And so over the whole 12 hours, my neck is, you know, I'm putting myself in the worst of predicament. Because whenever someone breaks their neck, they're supposed to be stable and, and receive medical attention. But for the whole 12 hours, I'm turning my head back and forth, and I'm saying, help, I can't move, I can't move, I can't move. And they just walk back and forth, uh, you know, fix food, uh, fix breakfast. And then Friday morning came, they ran errands, you know. And they, covered me, they covered me with newspaper because I lost control of my bowels and bladder. So you laid there for how long? About 12 hours. 12, 12 yeah. hours. Finally, you somehow got to the hospital. Well, my sister, she came in. Um, Friday morning, saw me on the ground and um, contacted the ambulance. But she attempted to call, contact the ambulance from our house. But since we didn't have health insurance, my mom made her contact the ambulance from her friend's house. And so she contacted the ambulance from her friend's house, and uh, the ambulance took me to the hospital. And I woke up out of a drug induced coma, and they told me I'd be paralyzed for the rest of my life. They told you you'd never walk? Never walk. I would use vegetable arms. I wouldn't move my arms. I wouldn't be able to have filling in my legs or bowel and bladder function. I would just be paralyzed the rest of my life. So here you are laying in the hospital bed. Yeah. You were how long are you in the hospital? Oh man, off and on for about three years, about you know, two or three years. But right afterwards, you realize I can't walk. I'm paralyzed. Yeah. Get any support from your mom, your family? No, um, my mom. You know, she stayed with her boyfriend. Um, she stayed with him to this day. She married him, so so basically, wasn't any support there. And uh, I didn't have a lot of family members. She didn't prosecute the boyfriend. No, for doing this. no, no. And and I and you know and, and where my mind was, where my mindset was back then in '97. I. You know, it was kind of like battered wife syndrome, a little bit battered woman syndrome, where you feel like the person who abused you, you know, that, that you kind of feel sorry for that person, you don't want that person to get locked up or get in trouble. So, so, I, so that's the attitude that I had. I really didn't want to, you know, quote unquote snitch on my mother or her boyfriend for what they did to me. And so I was kind of uncooperative with, with, the, uh, with the police as far as giving the statement. Even though I couldn't talk, you know, it was like, Blink twice for yes, blink once for no, but I still, you know, wasn't wholeheartedly willing to share what happened. Yeah. So, 
pretty rough. Most people at this point give up. Got nobody, got nothing to live for. But that's not how you saw it. No, it's not. I uh, basically, you know, of course, put you know, my spiritual faith in God uh, and encouragement from friends, you know, that I met, I met along the journey. I started studying for my GED. I was at, the, I was at my third nursing home. So I've lived in a total of three different nursing homes. And I was at my third nursing home. And uh, I said, I, I was like kind of at a fork, fork in the road, either waste the way and live off the state, you know, live off the government and not do anything with your life, or move forward, get your GED, get your college degree, and, and uh, become successful. And so I decided to um, become successful, and so I studied for my GED, and I passed that with flying colors, and immediately I started going to Tulsa Community College. And while at Tulsa Community College, so I- What are you thinking? <laughs> you, you, you. Jerry, living in a nursing home, but I'm gonna get a college degree. Well, I, 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 I was fed up. With, I was fed up with my with my life at that time. I was like, I know I can do better. You know, I know that I can make a positive change in my life. I know I can make a positive impact in my life. And so I, I, just, I was just fed up with my current situation. I was just tired of it. I want, excuse me. I wanted to do something different. I wanted to be productive. I didn't want to just waste away in a nursing home. Yeah, that, that became open. Feeling sorry for myself became open. And so I started studying for my GED. And because and I've always had, a, like, a, like I was telling you guys about my real estate dreams and everything like that, I've always had a wild imagination. And I'm, I've, I've always been a dreamer. And, and, and that's, what has, that's what really helped me overcome those childhood experiences that I've had. And so here I'm in this wheelchair at this nursing home, and the average age is like 85 years old. So I'm pretty, you know, long, um, alone there, pretty isolated. I didn't have anyone to really talk to because everybody else was 80 and 90. You know, some of them, you know, mentally wasn't mentally was unstable. So I said, well, I have to do something, you know, and um, and so I, I really just, you know, me embracing education, and then uh, my entrepreneurship streak kind of came back, and it was like I started selling T-shirts again. Uh, Set of nursing uniforms, perfume. Oh, man, I was, I was You're the, selling stuff to the nursing home? Yeah, I'm selling stuff to the residents, to, to, <laughs> to the residents' family members, to the, to my classmates at TCC and OSU, and uh, then I'm going up and down the street selling clothes outside the grocery store. And I'm just you know, back at it. You know, I got I, uh, got on the internet and I found a lot of wholesale connections and contacted them. I had you know a little money. Uh, you know, for guys that would say, I started buying large quantities of different general merchandise, and I would receive it, a COD, cash on delivery, and uh, I pay for whatever the package get there, and I would start selling it. And uh, yeah, that, that, that really gave me a lot of hope, and it really made me happy, you know, because. And all this time, you're telling yourself, I'm gonna walk. Yeah, oh yeah, definitely. Doctor said, no way, you said. I said, I'm, I, I gotta do it. I, I will do it, everything is possible. Um, so basically in 2001, I started, I started looking for um, a sponsor for rehabilitation. And did you have your degree put in? Uh, no, I, I received my, my, my social, social degree at 2002. Tulsa Community. Yes, right, right, right. So now you've gone from high school dropout to GED to I got an associate's degree from TCC. Yes. And around that same time, I said to myself, well, after watching Christopher Reeve on television, I said, yeah, and I was already motivated to, I, okay, basically, whenever the doctor told me I was paralyzed for the rest of my life, there was a small force inside of me that told me that, that I, would be, I would be fine, I would, I, would do, I, would, I would be okay. And over the years, that voice became louder and louder and louder. And so, basically, in 2002, I started my campaign to walk, basically, and that whole, plan was to find a sponsor for rehabilitation if I can go to Barnes George Hospital in St. Louis. And I, I didn't have the money to go up there, but I knew that, that I was able, I knew I had enough mobility to, you know, to be accepted in the program. And so uh, in 2003, uh, because of my interest in the oil and gas industry, I uh, met a, a guy named Tibu Pickens. And um, I met him for the first time. And, uh, 
asked him for a business card. And I told him that I was going to be a commodities trader, because at that time I was studying to be a commodities trader. So you and met him because you went to some... The oil and gas conference. Yes, and, and the reason why I went was to learn more about, was to network and to actually find a job trading uh, oil and gas and learn more about the, the industry. But you went through the crowd afterwards right up to T. Boone and started talking. Yes, and uh, I told him I was going to be a commodities trader and uh, he gave me kind of a little small talk and asked for a business card. I remember that you always have a big, you always collect business cards. You know, that's, that's, one, that's one thing that you never should, you know. Not do. You always got to get a business card, no matter whoever you meet. And so I asked for a business card. And then I went home and uh, threw his card in my drawer and uh, continued on my mission to, to get a sponsor for rehabilitation. I didn't, I didn't uh, want to approach Boone Pickens because he didn't seem like a guy that I would, that, 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 that would take interest in me. You know, I kind of thought, well, this guy's cold hearted. You know, he's, he can care less about me or my situation or whatever, right? So I just, I, I didn't think of him as an individual to approach. So after, so basically, I met him in March 2003. And so here it is, August 2003, I ran through $1,500, uh, spent it on telephone calls. So, so, but what you're trying to do is get some sponsors to buy some equipment. So you can go to this place in St. Louis and get some proper rehabilitation. Yes. You need the equipment. Right. And you need somebody to help pay for you to go there as well. Exactly. So you started writing letters? Or? I, what I did, I, I started writing letters. I uh, created a business plan and I sent it to over 100 companies. So you created the Nate Waters business plan? Right, exactly. Right. 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 How I was going to pay them back and everything. And, and basically, how I was going to pay them back was through my uh, Series 3 because I was studying to be a commodities trader. And plus, I earned my social degrees. I felt like I was the man on top of the world with a social degree. And, you know what I mean? I'm like, okay, this is how I'm going to do it. This is how I'm going to pay them back. You know, and I uh, created this plan and figured out how much it was going to cost and everything. You start sending requests. You send your business plan and requests to... Uh, basically, uh, Chase Manhattan, uh, uh, American Express, Tootsie Roll, I mean, <laughs> the Oprah Winfrey Show, I mean, every, everywhere. I mean, all over the country. Particular, in particular companies that I would love to work for. Because I, I thought that, okay, if they help me, then I can sign a contract and work for them to pay off the money that they spent on me. So how, I thought, many did you, how many did you contact? A hundred. Over a hundred. How many rejections? A uh, hundred. <laughs> <laughs> so one after another, just rejection, rejection, no, or no response? It, it, it was, it was kind of like, you know, I was, out, of, out, of, out of those hundred, packages I sent, I received seven letters, and uh, some of them said, well, uh, we're not interested in helping you, or, you know, you, you stay too far, or, you know, you're not a non-profit entity, or, you know, good luck in your pursuits. And the other ones, you know, they just didn't bother to contact me at all. Um, I did contact some of them, they hung up in my face, or said, well, Nate, you're you lucky to live in a nursing home, so you should just, you should just be complacent with what you already have, you know. Time to give up? Nope. They wanted me to, I mean, some of the people that I talked to wanted me to give up. They said, well, maybe you may not get further than what you got, further as you made it right now. So you might as well just hang it up. At least you are breathing, or you know, at least you are, at least you have a bed that you can go to sleep in and stuff. And, you know, and that's not good enough for me, you know what I mean? I said, no, I don't want to hear that, you know. So um, I was very depressed. It was in August. And the walls were closing in on me at the nursing home. And so I went into my drawer and I found that T Boone Pickens card. Because something told me to uh, find a T Boone Pickens card and call him. And so that's what I did. I called him and I talked with him. I spoke with his assistant and told his assistant about what I, what I was wanting to do. And so I emailed her, and faxed, I faxed her all of my newspaper articles that, I, that I've done over the last, I guess, five years, you know, until 2003. And uh, she said, uh, well, let me, uh, she told me to call her back. And I called her back, and then the next thing you know, uh, I was talking with Bowden, and he said, well, Nate, uh, I can't promise you anything, but I'll see what I can do. And so November 2003, he sent me to Barnes Jewish Hospital for an evaluation 
to, uh, to see if I qualify for the Spinal Cord Research Program that Christopher Reeve, you know, pretty much authored. And I, I was approved for that uh, program. And I was so happy. I was like, wow, this is my dream is really coming true, you know. Um, and so after I was approved for that, Boone sent me back up there in February of 2004 for 20 day, for a 20 day inpatient uh, rehab visit to learn how to utilize specialized equipment, to learn how to, you know, do different therapies and things of that sort, and different th uh, types of therapies I could do at home. Okay, so then when I made it back from St. Louis after those 20 days, I had to buy over $50,000 equipment. And uh, boom, kind of surprised me and uh, had all this equipment sent to Tulsa. I didn't know where to put it at. I'm like, oh my God, who sent, who sent all this equipment to me? And so I had to find a place to, to have the, to place the equipment. And I did. And um, that was in June of 2004. So you put it someplace where not just you, but other people. Yes, exactly. At the Center for Individuals with Physical Challenges in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And um, you know, I got placed it there. And then I was kind of hesitant about that because I'm like, wow, this is expensive equipment here. I hope these guys take good care of it. And uh, they made me feel very comfortable about that. And, and so I started going there two to three days a week to uh, work out. And other people with spinal cord injuries and strokes and amputees and other people with disabilities in general, they would have to utilize equipment also. So now you're getting use of your arms? I'm getting more, you know, getting more strength in my upper body, my arms, my hands, uh, getting my activity in my legs, my uh, abdominal muscles, my back muscles. And you know, and uh, whatever, I, around that time, because it's, it's, a, it's a slow process, you know. It's, it's definitely not an overnight type of thing. But as I, you know, when I go to the doctor to get checkups, or when I get checkups from a doctor, they always tell me, well, Nate, I couldn't believe that, that you, you've been able, I, I still can't believe that you've been able to do what you've been able to do. You know, because I would cuss my neck down, and I used to have to have a, a brace that I put over my arm to help eat. And then, then I had, you know, I couldn't even eat for a long time because I was so weak, I couldn't even raise my hand to my mouth. Now it's hard for me to, to keep a piece of that in my hand every day. You know? So, so this sounds like the end of the story, but it's not the end of the story. No, it's not the end of the story. It's not the end of the story. Um, did you get your degree? I did. I, uh, I earned my bachelor's in business administration from OSU in uh, December of 2005. And uh, Bo Pickett spoke at my graduation. And that was a very wonderful time in my life. Um, however, a year before I graduated, I started working at Williams Company. Um, you know, that's kind of a, you know, interesting story of determination. You know, just having a passion to get involved in the oil and gas business. I passed out over 50 resumes, and uh, you know, people weren't interested. In they were like, well, they give me a call, or well, I'll talk to you later, or something like that. Nate, well, you maybe need, maybe need to get your MBA or your doctor degree to get a job or something. You know, it just it, I just heard so many excuses, and but I didn't give up. I just stay. I just persisted. I just was, I was very persistent. I would uh, catch the bus to downtown Tulsa and different office complexes and ride up and down elevators throughout the day, passing out resumes to different offices. Um, but you know, and, and catching the bus isn't an easy thing. No, it's not. It, it, it's not easy. You have to call. You have to plan your day at least a week in advance, you know, to, to go somewhere the next day. And so I will like contact the public transportation system and tell them this is where I need to be. I want to be picked up here. And and if I'm not there, they will leave you. And so that means I'm stranded, you know. And so I, I was very meticulous about the times that I wanted to show up at the different office buildings and, and different companies. But I was very dead set on finding a job in the oil and gas business. Um, you know, a lot of people would turn me down, and there were times where I would just feel like I felt those walls closing in on me again. You know, it's four walls, and you know, you don't want those walls to close in on you. And then, you know, there were times where I, where I would even ask myself, well, uh, I guess, is, is this it, you know? Because when people tell you negative things so much, you almost like, you almost, you almost start to believe it all. You know, but I didn't believe it to the point where I gave up. You know, so I, I went back out there, pound the pavement some more, and uh, got in contact with a guy, uh, Lloyd Noble. Uh, he, uh, I don't know if you've ever heard the Lloyd Noble Center at OU. Uh, his grandson, and uh, his grandson asked me. He said, uh, "Nate, 
uh, have you tried Williams Company? And I said, well, uh, no, I haven't. And uh, he contacted the CEO at Williams and, uh, and said, uh, you need to interview this guy. And so did the interview, next thing you know, I was hired. And I've been there for about seven years now. But uh, if I would have gave up after 30 people told me no, I'd probably still be, be unemployed right now. You know? So you ended up getting that? Yes, ended up landing a job on the trading floor, uh, buying and selling electricity. So here's that dream coming true. Yes, yes. And uh, I was very happy about it. I mean, uh, it, and what's so good about it that the company encouraged me because you know, I've been involved in a lot of public speaking before I started at Williams. I, was, I started doing public speaking and, and uh, doing a lot of volunteer work for different nonprofits, you know, in the area of child abuse or domestic violence. And, you know, you, you know, just trying to give back and, and giving back by fundraising and marketing. I may not, I may not have had a $100,000 check to give, but I have to raise $100,000, you know. Um, and uh, when I started at Williams Company, you know, they encouraged that. And they you told me something that just really stunned me. You said as, as you came out, as you came back from laying in that hospital bed, and you built your life, and you achieved all these things, you told me that not only you weren't getting any support at home, but your mom actually resented Yes, she's uh, I guess I guess we'll say a player here. And and it really it really hurts me real bad inside my heart, uh, you know that that she feels that way about me and stuff. You know, it, but I can't dwell on it. You know, I I gotta keep on being aggressive and pushing forward. That you know I still have a long way to go. You know, I mean I'm still have goals and aspirations that I have not reached yet. You know this, and, this is the thing. You still have dreams. Yes, still. It's not over. In fact, you had a dream to get out of that hospital. You had a dream to start to use your arms, to use your legs, you had a dream to get a college degree, you had a dream to get a, a real job, you had a dream and then you had another dream, didn't you? Yes, um, this dream, because I've been to three different nursing homes over the last uh, 13 years. And the reason why I have, the reason why I've lived in nursing homes is because of the lack of, you know, the lack of, of a place for me to go, or lack of family or support for me to be able to live at home somewhere. And so I, I um, it's kind of, we live in a nursing home it's kind of like your home that's when you live in a nursing home. I mean, in, in my in my situation, because I didn't know that to live, and so you so you so you come dependent on a Medicaid, uh, you know, a welfare system, and they and they kind of it's kind of a situation where once you get in, it's hard to get out, you know. And so I, what I started to do, I started to contact CEOs all over the country and different politicians within the state of Oklahoma about the situation about individuals who have became paralyzed or injured who live in nursing homes and who are trying to get out of them and but they're having a hard time doing that and so um, you know I was on that campaign for a very long time and uh, I come to realize that it's um, it's, it's uh, not, to, not to bust anybody's bubble but in, in the world of politics money talks you know what I mean and if you don't have any money it's hard to get things changed. But um, due to my friendship with uh, people in Pickens, I, I met a guy named Harold Ham, Harold and Sue Ham, and um, you know, he's an entrepreneur. And um, met him at a football game in 2007. And um, we just when we started immediately. We started talking about oil and gas trading and uh, bond trading because that's you know kind of you know we had, had those things in common. And so in 2009, he uh, told me, him and his wife told me they wanted, they wanted to help me out. And I thought, okay, well, what they mean by helping me out is talking to politicians with me. But that's what I was doing, talking to politicians, trying to get some policy changed. But what it actually meant was buying me a house. And uh, I mean, 
bought me a, a house, I mean, just writing a check, just buying me a house and, and paying for nursing care for me. And so that was, you know, that was, that was a, a, a real tough thing because I lived in this particular nursing home, at this last nursing home for the last 12 years. And so here I am going to leave all my neighbors who I became very good friends with. And, and uh, I felt like I had like 150 grandmothers. <laughs> and that, that's a good thing. I mean, I'm going to say that's a good thing because I, I never really had a real good relationship with my grandmother. And I didn't know my grandfather because he died when my mom was really young. So, so I really didn't have any grandparent relationships and stuff. So here at this nursing home, I mean, they embraced me and everything like that. But and I had to, you know, it was an opportunity for me to move to my own home. So uh, Harold had wrote me, a, uh, basically just gave me a blank check basically and said, hey, uh, pick what makes sense to you. And so I uh, found a, a patio home in Tulsa and, uh, and held part of the floors done and furniture and everything like that. Because you know, I didn't have any furniture besides my clothing and a television at the nursing home. So I had to buy all new furniture and everything. And uh, so I moved in and just this past, this past September, and it's coming up September 23rd would be a year since I've lived in my, in my I guess, first and only home. And uh, it, it's, it's, it's been a blessing, you know. I, I'm very thankful for it. Um, you know, Harold, he, he pays for the nursing care for me. And, uh, you know, my, he don't want me to pay him back, but my ultimate goal, you know, is to pay him back, you know, because, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm overly thankful for what, he, what he's done for me, you know. I just want to express to him how, how much I really appreciate it, you know. Um, However, uh, it's all about paying it forward. So, you know, I'm heavily involved in different nonprofit organizations like the American Diabetes Association, uh, Bridges Foundation, and, and uh, American Cancer Society. And what I do for them, I help raise money for them. You know, because I love talking to people and, and you know, convincing people about different causes that, you know, that affect all of us, you know. Not only causes that affect people with disabilities, but diabetes affect everyone. I'm sure that's someone in this room that knows someone dealing with diabetes, you know, and so I'm heavily involved with that. Um, and and, and that, 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 that gives me a lot of fulfillment. And I use a lot of my entrepreneurship principles with that. Quite a story, huh? story with you for a reason. What I hope you heard was a story that is all about values, human values, personal values. So let's let that sit for a moment, reflect on that a little bit. But how about introducing our other entrepreneur? one, uh, Mr. Stan Clark. Stan Clark is a native of Tulsa, Oklahoma, graduated from Oklahoma State University in May of 19, 1975 with a Bachelor of Science degree in Business Administration. Uh, just two months after graduation, Clark and his co-founder, Steve Fowle, started Stillwater's Jumpin' Little Juke Joint, Eskimo Joe's. The company started as a bar and changed to a full-service restaurant after the drinking age in Oklahoma was raised in 1984. After the switch, the business started having more sales from the non-alcoholic sector. Uh, and by the end of that uh, first six month period, uh, food and the addition of clothing sales combined represented just over 50% of the company. Clark has built a restaurant and, detail and retail brand that has gained national and even international notoriety. Uh, his corporation, Stan Clark Companies, has four well-recognized businesses, businesses namely, <coughs> Eskimo Joe's Restaurant, Mex Mexico Joe's Restaurant, uh, Giuseppe's Italian Kitchen, and Eskimo Joe's Pro uh, Promotional Products Group. One of the company's legacies is its support of Stillwater's community, uh, particularly uh, in the Stillwater area, United Way. Eskimo Joe's has sponsored the hosted and hosted the ju joint jog for more than 20 years and has uh, been the title sponsor of the Three Amigos uh, United Way Golf Classic uh, for 16 years. 
They've also sponsored or contributed to numerous other uh, state, community, and educational fundraising events and organizations. Uh, the associates at Stan Clark Companies have contributed countless hours and lots of talent to a large number of worthy causes. It is certain that Clark and his organization have much to be proud of when it comes to uh, the record of philanthropy. <laughs> Uh, please help me welcome Stan Clark. So Stan's going to tell a little bit of his story and then I'll ask a couple of questions. Sounds great. Hi everybody. It's really an honor to be with you and share the stage with Nate. We did this last year and the story is, is something else to tell you. Thank you. Well, um, if you want the entrepreneurial piece first, I graduated from OSU in May of 75. Um, about the only thing I ever wanted to do except work for myself was I, I kind of thought I'm going to teach because I did enjoy college business. Pretty good student. So I, I hooked up an, I mean a, uh, an assistantship for the fall semester. So I'm hanging out over my friend's house. He lived at 303 South Ramsey, which is basically about two blocks south of here. Now that's all been cleared out now. I think it's going to be the Performing Arts Center pretty soon. Uh, that part of that side of the south side of campus here. But at any rate, I'm laying on the couch. It's 3.30 in the afternoon. I'm watching reruns of Star Trek. You know, just really industrious <laughs> guy that I was, you know, right after graduation. And uh, Steve walks in. It's his place. He goes open the front doors and he goes, hey, Clark, I'm going to open the bar. He says, oh, the bar's right here. It's great. I said, God, you know, Fox cool. I down over there's this cool two-story building for rent right down the street from the Great Fox. The Great Fox was where the Cowboy Book is today. And I said, I'll go partner for you. So boom, we, we drive down to watch Now Joe's. I always say as fate would have it, the owner of the property was there that Sunday afternoon. Because had he not been, this was such a wild hair spur of the deal. I swear I don't know if we'd ever gone back down on Monday or Tuesday or if it ever even come back up. But because he was there, within about 10 minutes, we shook hands and uh, decided we are going to rent that building and we're going to start borrowing. Now, um, one comment I'll make is, you know, so much for market research, right? <laughs> I mean, we literally, it, it, oh, and it, oh, by the way, highly complex negotiation took place, you know. He said, well, fellas, if you want it like you see it, it'll be 350 a month. If you want me to air condition, I'm going to need 400. And we said, well, it's pretty hot around here in the summer. I think we're going to need some air conditioning. So let's go ahead and go with the air conditioning. And but we shook hands and uh, back to values. I mean, we were men of our word. We weren't going to go back on that. We meant it. So, you know, this was a Sunday afternoon, as I said. So the next day, Monday, we decided to drive back over to Tulsa where we were raised to tell our parents, you know, what we're going to do with this education they provided us. We're going to open a bar. And... Uh, Interestingly, uh, I skipped over the piece, but my dad really had always encouraged me to think entrepreneurially, to consider working for myself. So I always thought I would, um, because I was given that support, uh, encouraged in that direction. So the whole time I went through the college of business, I was always thinking about how I would apply the principles I was learning to my own concern. I never even got close to getting a job. I did go through some interviews on campus in that spring semester 75, but I didn't have the right stuff to say. I wasn't talking about my dream of working for that company. I was always, you know, they asked me, I'd say, well, I really kind of really make a deal. And so I uh, didn't get anywhere in that direction. But I am thankful for that. You know, uh, my dad not only encouraged me along those lines, I actually kind of observed uh, the change for our family when he went from being a vice president of a very large company to becoming an owner of a company. And that happened when I was in about fifth grade. And we moved from uh, basically fairly uh, south of Admiral, which is barely the south dividing line in Tulsa, to the far south extreme of Tulsa back then, uh, just south of 51st Street, which was really the end of Tulsa at the point. This was like 1963. And, um, you know, so I just saw the difference. I mean, all of a sudden, we're living in a parade of homes home. And our lifestyle changed dramatically. Um, you know, I, I just had nothing to complain about about the way I was raised. I was given everything I wanted or needed. 
Uh, but most importantly, I was encouraged. And I was encouraged to be an entrepreneur. I was told and made to believe I could do anything I wanted to do. And uh, so for that, I'm, I'm forever thankful. And tonight's topic, I was raised on wonderful values. Uh, just nurtured by my parents, uh, you know, taught right from wrong. I remember my dad teaching me a, a traumatic lesson as a young boy. I really wasn't picking on this kid, I promise. But my friends were, and I was, and I was present, and I didn't do anything about it. I'll never forget that. Be talking about, you know, just the intrinsic value of every human being deserving to be treated with dignity and respect. So, you know, those those great values I was raised on, and then a great business education, um, and then a simple business idea, but it didn't take a lot of capital to get it going. I'll never forget my mom wasn't crazy about the idea of going into the bar business, but my dad he saw the sparkle in Steve and my eyes, and he knew we were serious about it. So he encouraged us to he said, you guys need to go back to Stillwater, do your homework, get busy, because you're going to have to figure out, you know, you're going to have to get somebody to loan you some money. Because I'm not putting any money in this blank, blank. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he was very direct about that. I knew exactly what he meant. He wasn't going to, wasn't going to help us out on that. So at any rate, um, again, but, but still encouraging, knowing I was serious about it and knowing I could do it. And unfortunately, again, when I was raised, I, I felt like in my heart hearts I could do it as well. So. Anyway, that's kind of the very early stuff. Um, we did get open within about 60 days after we uh, first negotiated that, uh, that lease. Um, we decided to open because summer school is about to let out. Our uh, big marketing ploy was we stuck flyers under the dorm room doors of the one dorm that was open in the summer of 75, which was totally illegal to do on state property, but you know, I always like to say uh, sometimes ignorance is bliss, we didn't know any better, and sometimes it's easier to apologize than it is to get permission. Not great values, I'll admit. <laughs> <laughs> you know, desperate, desperate. You know, the, the, uh, big, the big piece of being an entrepreneur is taking a risk, and we certainly had taken a risk. The best job I'd had, you know, prior to doing what we did uh, would have taken me years certainly to pay off at you know a couple bucks an hour even the twenty thousand dollars or so we did it up bar by the time we actually got the place open at any rate just an absolute labor of love it's like we were having a party every night i got to be the host i loved doing it and uh serving guests and uh, just delighting other people very natural to me i have a passion for it i still love the hospitality business and uh and i like um I just, I just like doing it. So it was just a blast from day one. Um, should mention that we did, uh, Steve came up with the idea to open bar. He also came up with the name Eskimo Joe's. Fortunately, I had three hours of marketing in Oklahoma State, so you know I must have been the marketing guru of the group, right? <laughs> but I knew we needed a logo. I knew we needed a logo. And so we hired a freshman commercial arts student, a friend of Steve's younger brother. He sketched Eskimo Joe and Buffy on an art pad about yay big with a magic marker sitting in one of the front windows of Eskimo Joe's actually. And uh, boy, the first time I laid eyes on that, I fell in love with her name and I just, I just thought it hooked. I thought it, you know, was, was great. I've had 36 years to reflect on it, you know, think about it. It's a boy and his dog. It's a universal theme. Anybody gets it. Eskimo Joe's got that great big smile, which I think draws you in. It's endearing. Uh, it's just, it's got so much appeal, it's unbelievable, and yet, you know, what we know. Um, for, for that logo, and for hand painting both sides of our original sign, we paid Bill Thompson $35. Now, I really loved it, I thought it was worth 50 but Steve talked me down at 35 <laughs> uh, You know, I mean, kind of the rest is history, obviously I can go through lots and lots of things. But the good news was we had we had a product that people wanted. You know, I always remember back in Econ 101 or you know 11, 13 probably was whatever. You know, if you want to start a business, the first question to ask yourself is: Is there a market for it? I kidded earlier about market research. I actually had done a little market research in my four years at Oklahoma State. I've been in a few bars. You know, I did know the simple <laughs> man for three two beer here. And back then it was 18 was legal. If you had a college ID, man, you were in. All of them. It didn't matter. 
So it was pretty wide open, and there was a lot of beer drinking going on. So we knew there was demand for the product. Um, so anyway, we were actually very profitable very quickly, and I say very, it's on a, it's on a relative scale. Our expectations weren't that high. Um, we, you know, we sold, we sold the product for more than we bought it for every day. We put all the money in the bank, including we emptied the pool tables and the foosball tables and all that. I mean, it was, it was a low grossing deal. But, you know, we, we were throwing off some profitability, and our overhead was very low. So, you know, very quickly, we were at least making and uh, boy, that was plenty of reward for me to get to have the party again the next night and host it. Spin the tunes and stand behind the bar and drink the beer with everybody. I mean, it really was just a party and, and a lot of fun at that. Um, I was able to focus enough on the business and not go so deep off on the party and, you know, to, to actually keep it going and keep it successful. Um, I guess the last thing I'd mention is we did actually have Eskimo Joe's t shirts for sale the very first day we opened. I thought of them merely as a medium for word of mouth advertising. I thought they could really do the job there. And it was also the ultimate affirmation if someone would buy the shirt. It was like, man, they really like the place, you know, because you're, you're buying into it, you know. And so that meant the world to me. And someone would buy one, I was just absolutely thrilled to death. But we literally sold, uh, our first order of shirts was 72, six dozen shirts. We sold them all within the first week we were in business. And that was just foreshadowing of great things to come. It took me forever to understand the true potential of that side of it. But I did know it was exciting and meant the world to me. And so every time we'd sell out, we'd order more and we'd keep, you know, we would keep replenishing. But uh, we didn't really uh, start managing it well and running it uh, like a standalone business for many, many years uh, after the fact. But, uh, you know. Let's, let's get into the Q&A piece, you know, as I can go on. So, so uh, it would seem that these are two disparate stories have little in common, but are there aspects of Nate's story that say anything about Eskimo Joe's? Well, I'd say so. Um, you know, certainly, you just think about um, early on, just the escapism. The fact that you found your identity by being entrepreneurial, almost as an escape from your situation. I'm not going to say I had a bad situation by any stretch, but I certainly found identity in opening that restaurant, and, or that bar at the time, and it just meant the world to me. I mean, that was just like, wow. I mean, that was more fun than anything I'd ever done. I just couldn't even imagine it enjoying something that much and then to be deriving some some success from that um, you know pretty pretty incredible and i will say this you know it's not to say it was just overnight man the place is packed you know flowing out into the street and everything we were right down the street with the gray fox we wanted to locate there for a reason i can remember many nights when steve and i didn't need to both close the place because everybody was up the street to Gray Fox. They were overflowing out into the street. You know, you'd leave shows and there's maybe 10 or 15 people in there and you drive by the Fox and there's 2,000 people in there. And, you know, kind of kind of wishing, you know, that gosh, I wish everybody was in my place and not down the street. But certainly not about to give up. And uh, believe in my heart of hearts, we had something very special right from the get-go. Because the folks that were coming in there, they did really like it. And I could just feel the energy of the connection. So it was more than enough to continue to motivate me and drive me to want to do it again and do it again and do it again. Um, so I never, never kind of lost sight of the goal, if you will, and never really was, uh, was short-term in my thinking. Even early on, I, was, I felt like we were building something that the people that liked it were telling others and that if, we, if we'd stay the course and deliver value, and, and, with, and by the way, value was fun. I mean, I still say it to this day, our vision of greatness and, and, and Smiles 101, which is our orientation everybody goes to, becomes the work for us. Really, what we do is we give people a good time. That is, that's the main thing we do. And it should always be fun to come to one of our places, whether it's a retail store at Woodland Hills or Pittsburgh Mall, or whether it's Giuseppe's Italian Kitchen or Mexico Joe's or Joe's. Really, it's all about showing them a good time. And if we create a good feeling, we think they'll want to do that again and again. Um, 
I think I got that early on. Um, I, I probably wouldn't have articulated it quite like I do 36 years later. But I certainly knew that uh, the way I made that customer feel was really all I really had to hold, you know. If they didn't, if they didn't have a great time, they didn't like the place, then they certainly didn't have to come back. There were a lot of other people uh, that were more than willing to sell the beer, that's for sure. So it was never a point where you went, well, every college guy wants to have his own bar someday. I had my bar, that was fun. Now what's, I'm like, it was never like that. It's always been. Interestingly, it was not for me. And uh, I don't think this was a leading question, but I'm going to take it there. But it was kind of like that for my original bar. Two and a half years later, uh, he got married. He kind of wanted a different. And he wanted to sell his half interest, and I very much wanted to buy his half interest. I was the guy that really liked running the place more. Uh, we were very different um, personality types. He was actually a stronger, uh, willed guy probably than I was. Maybe a little bolder. Um, I'm not sure I ever would have done it. Like I said, it was his idea. But boy, once we were running it, I, I could I understood that. I knew how to treat a customer. I, and I knew we were doing something that they were perceiving to be of value. So I think I had a lot more passion for running Eskimo Joe's, actually doing what we did. Steve kind of saw it as we didn't have much money in that, we were making a little something on that. And he wanted to go look for the next deal. So we were just different in that aspect. And uh, So, no, I, I, I was all about, hey, this is working. I, I'm going to make something out of this. So that was more my motivation, more my drive. But it's not always been up, up, up. Oh, no. oh no, not at all. I mean, I can I can cite countless times when uh, when we made blunders and made made mistakes, many of which were very expensive. But um, probably the most dramatic time was fast forward a little ways. Once we put the first kitchen in Joe's, that opened in the spring of '84. I just it was just like wow, this is awesome. All of a sudden, you know, we were just appealing to everybody as everybody eats every day. Prior to that, you know, just a bar, basically serving the OSU community. That was a very limited target market. And so we went from a very limited target market to basically anybody and everybody. And I always liked to kid. I was really tickled to find out in, uh, in the spring of 1984 that more people eat every day than drink every day. But it was awesome, you know, everything we worked towards and everything we did, showing people it's a good time, et cetera, you know, all of a sudden now it's translating and it's being absorbed by so many more people. So that was very exciting. And I decided I needed to try another one. And we opened Stillwater Bay, our second restaurant, uh, not very long after the kitchen opened at Joe's, about, about five months later in September of 84. And, and Stillwater Bay was literally an overnight success. It was. It was packed from the get-go. And it was very, very popular. Um, back then, happy hours were legal. We had a great happy hour in the afternoons with half-price uh, appetizers and two-for-one drinks. And I mean, the place was jumping. Back then, uh, I remember very well, the president of the university was, was a guy that kind of liked a, a cocktail. And he'd show up a lot of afternoons and, and a whole lot of the uh, you know, faculty. And, and just a lot of the community. I mean, it was just a going deal. Uh, we brought a, a different mix to the market than anybody else had at that time. And so anyway, it was wildly successful very, very quickly, and that was good. So now, let's fast forward a couple more years. I've, I've bought a building downtown. I decided to move to Water Bay downtown. And I decided to open a third restaurant, Mexico Joe's, in the original Bay location. Now, this was over behind Cowboy Mall. It's no longer even there. It's now a campus building that almost abuts the back end of Cowboy Mall, if you're familiar with what I'm talking about. But at the time, really kind of a neat little place, and I spent a fortune on it, remodeling another guy's piece of property, which is a lesson learned. I don't ever, so I never want to do that again. But so I felt like I had to do this third restaurant concept. It's taken me a while to get to the crux of the matter, but I will. So I opened the third restaurant, undercapitalized, made the cardinal sin of, of opening too early, we weren't well enough trained, and we did a lousy job for a lot of customers. Because here's this guy's, you know, getting pretty, pretty uh, infamous around town. He's got now three restaurants. Everybody wants to come check it out, and we didn't perform very well. 
And by the end of the summer of 87, I mean, I was desperate. And we were losing more money over there at Mexico Joe's than I ever thought I was going to make. And uh, so basically the whole company was really very much at risk. And I remember I was taking cash advances on credit cards to meet payroll. You know, your comment earlier about payroll. You know, and the guy wants to kick you out of the building and all. I'm thinking, that's connecting quite well. But uh, that was not very long ago. I remember that very, very clearly. Fortunately, in the, in the fall of 87, we got a lease on Andy's Grocery Building, which is right next door to Eskimo Joe's. And we opened Joe's Closed World Headquarters back in 1987. Actually, September 5th of 1987. And uh, the good news was people liked that shopping experience. They could touch and see what we had. Before that, we'd sold all the Joe's clothes over the bar, in the restaurant. And Joe's clothes sales really took off. Uh, that fall and of course I was making enough money there I was able to keep Mexico Joseph float by the end of the year you know we'd ironed out all the kinks and the concept but it's tough to, ch to change people's mindset you know people drive up there aren't many cars there and kind of your suspect and so it took a long time to turn Mexico Joe's around but I will <laughs> proudly say in 1988 we broke even which was a huge improvement over 87 and we kind of never looked back after that it became a wonderful concept until finally we built the building from the ground up and opened it in the spring of 94 out there on Hall of Fame where we are today. And it's been a stellar concept ever since. But, you know, again, 1987 is not that long ago. So I remember it well. Um, so there's one example. Others, you know, when we get, once we got into the direct marketing business, you start trying to emulate other successful catalog companies. So we did that. And we start mailing out hundreds of thousands of catalogs that are very expensive to print and very expensive to mail with virtually no response whatsoever. And finally, the lights kind of come on after several of these trials and literally hundreds of thousands of dollars that we threw away. And realize that, hey, you know, if you don't have an affinity to Eskimo Joe's, you've never been to Stillwater, Oklahoma, you don't know anything about OSU, you don't need an Eskimo Joe's t-shirt. It doesn't matter how cute the little catalog is, it shows up in your in your uh, mailbox. That was another just real expensive lesson learned. So we were just pushing very hard for growth that just wasn't there. You know, today we've got 60,000 Facebook friends at Eskimo Joe's, which I'm real proud of. It's really exciting to, to have that kind of reach. But even back in the mid-90s, at that point, we were trying to mail 300,000 catalogs. You know, that was expensive. So that was, a, that was kind of another entrepreneurial little goal. The dice didn't work out so well. But, you know. Try to learn from it and, uh, and uh, keep going. Did, did you actually call it Joe's Closed World Headquarters from the beginning? We did. <laughs> we did. Does that make any sense at all? <laughs> <laughs> Probably not so much. But, you know, it was just tongue in cheek at the time. And, uh, gosh, you know, fast forward a few years, it, uh, Joe's smile truly has become a smile seen around the world as, as evidence on our website today, on our wall of fame. Literally, our, our friends and guests have, uh, have worn those shirts all around the world. And, and now with the internet, it's so easy to send you know, files electronically. Uh, it's really easy for people to send in pictures of, you know, of themselves and their families all around the globe. So that's really fun. We actually hear from lots of families that they intentionally travel in Joe's clothes because they conjure up you know, conversation wherever you go. People, hey, you ever been there? And anyway, it's very cool. So if we come back full circle, I mean, Stan, it's always an honor to have you here, but to have you here on this night is, is because your company is such a value-rich company. Can, can you talk a little bit about the role values play and the way you run the company? How deep you hire, the way you look at the customer? Not, I mean, it's sort of coming out of what you're saying anyway. Well, I'd have to say getting started at 22, Clearly, you start with the values you're raised with, you know, and so and those were solid. I talked a little bit about my father and how he just taught me the value of people. The other thing he modeled at home was I saw how much he cared about the people that were his partners um, and how he treated his customers. I mean, it, he was obsessed with it. He was driven by it, and uh, it was a very successful uh, business that they created. They were all roughly equal owners within just you know minuscule amount. He was the president, but but they were all equal in that kind of thing. 
and it was just really neat. So those were the kind of lessons that I uh, that I was raised with, and then, then his passion for his customers and his passion for the quality of work they did. I mentioned there, I think that they're gas pipeliners is what they were, um, and not from the wellhead like you would think of here in, a, in an oil producing state. This was a gas, natural gas distribution system. So it's like here in um, here in Stillwater, I guess it's ONG, I think, is where we get our natural gas. So it's the line that runs up to your apartment building or to your home. It's that type of uh, gas pipeline systems that they built. But, you know, whether it was um, the quality of an operator that's running a backhoe, digging a ditch, or the way they backfilled and the way they left the property for the property owner when they were finished, he just took so much pride in the quality of that work. And so those were the kinds of values I had. You know, and uh, uh, I worked at Ken's Pizza here at Stillwater when I was a sophomore at Oklahoma State from the uh, fall of 72 to the spring of 73. And that's really where I learned probably the most about how to interact with the customer. And uh, no slide on the College of Business, but I didn't get a lot of how to treat a customer in the College of Business. You know, I learned a lot about spreadsheets. I learned a lot. I took 15 hours of econ, 12 hours of accounting, only three hours of marketing, whatever. I, you know, I, and I loved the education, but it wasn't about that. So I, I really think I learned a lot about that. And then I think about, you know, the guy that owned that business was a franchisee of Ken's Pizza. Wasn't, uh, it wasn't a company-owned store. But, you know, it's sort of his values and the way he talked to us when he had a team meeting. Kind of the best lessons I had to, to hire people and to start training people and all that. So, just interesting. I, I like to use that in Smiles 101 as I talk to young folks, not unlike you guys, if you choose to join our team here at Stillwater and say, you know, hey, you never know how much you may be going to learn here. You know, the best work experience I had for starting my own business at age 22 was two years earlier when I was working at a pizza joint. You know, and for me, it was just, just some spending money and a, a chance to get through school. But gosh, you know, it turns out it's the best on-the-job training I ever had for just two years later. So there's certainly a lot to be learned. In that. And I think any and all work has tremendous value. Uh, so at any rate, learned a lot there. I guess, Mike, the question is it really goes back to the way I was raised. Um, just, you know, that I knew it was important to treat people well. And, uh, and then, you know, as we went along, and as I, you know, I quickly became a student of leadership and of management. Because if there's one thing I missed getting into the bar business, as young as I did, and the, frankly, the kind of lifestyle that became attendant to that, was I really did miss the intellectual stimulation. College of Business and Oklahoma State University. And so I very quickly started looking for seminars and just other ways to continue to work this part a little bit. And uh, so I, you know, I really have been just an adamant and remain an adamant student of, of leadership and everything, anything and everything business and, and all that kind of stuff. So I'm just reading constantly. And so anyway, that kind of thing. But these values show up in some other ways. I mean, we're in Stillwater, it's not a big town, it's a smaller town in the summertime, and, and, and yet you, a guiding thing in your business is this vision of greatness. Not, not vision of being good or being okay, or greatness is a pretty strong, what's that all about? Well, I mentioned that how I've been kind of driven to, uh, to continue to stay, um, sharp of mind at least, and uh, I got involved in a work study group with some fellow, uh, not all of them entrepreneurs so much, but at least successful business people uh, here in Stillwater, and it was led by a fellow by the name of Bob Hughes, and Bob worked out at uh, Meridian Technology in their business development center. And so we were exposing ourselves to uh, just the, the modern stuff of the day, whatever that might have been. Um, one of my favorite things we studied back in the early 90s um, was uh, Stephen Covey's book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. That was one thing that we did together as a group. Uh, but Tom Peters wrote a book in the late 80s called In Search of Excellence. And it was just basically a study of excellent companies. And it was a famous book. I saw Tom Peters speak in Oklahoma City not too long after he did that. And, quoted a lot of his 
of his theory and his ideas for a long time thereafter. But coming out of all of that, we then did a study um, out of Meridian Tech, which was called In Search of Excellence, based on Peter's writings and his principles. And coming out of that, Bob Hughes said, hey, have you ever done a visioning process for your company? And the answer was no, but I trusted Bob and I loved the kind of uh, business uh, development professional development we were getting out there at Meridian. So he, he encouraged me to do this process and basically just boiled down to figuring out what were our core values as human beings and how did we want to live those out through our business. And this, this occurred in 1990. I'm proud to say there's a bunch of people in my company that went through that process with me in 1990. That's 21 years ago. I think we've had nine people now that have gotten our 20-year service award. I didn't even think about doing it until many of the past 20 years. First year we had a little catch-up uh, where we gave several of them out. The 20 years is a, is a well of commitment, you know, and that's something I really wanted to do. But at any rate, so we created this vision of greatness. And you know, I agree with you, Mike, that's almost, that almost sounds bold or arrogant almost or something. I always, I always qualify that. I say it's not about us saying we're great. We're only great if our customers think we're great. I'm only great if you guys think I'm great, you know. My vision is that people who work here will look back and say it's the best job I ever had. Obviously, we want our customers to think we're the greatest restaurant company and the greatest retailer they've ever, they've ever used. So it's, it's about stuff like that. But our values are just throughout it. Now, I'll, I want to read one line that really means a lot to me. Recognizing that our people are our most important asset, we acknowledge that we can only hope to treat our guests as well as we willingly treat ourselves. I just love that one, you know. Uh, back to my dad, you know, everybody's equally as important. Uh, we want our suppliers, to, we want to be the favorite company every supplier we do business with does business with. So we just want to affect people that way. And of course we do that by uh, just by doing, doing things the right way. You know, there's just, there's just so many values throughout this thing, but it dictates how we work with each other, how we work with our guests, and how we work with our suppliers. The, basically, the three um, constituencies that, that are critical to our success. And so, anyway, it's, it's all here. You know, I could share it all with you. I don't want to read it to you. Um, if you do kind of work with us, with, you do get to learn all about it. <laughs> and what I do tell everybody is, this is not optional. You know, if you cannot embrace this, then you can't work here. Yeah, and frankly, please don't come back. You know, I want you to come back as a customer. You'll be a customer for life, please. But if you won't willingly do this, live this, you can't be a part of our company because you won't be a good fit. You can be a good person, but you won't be a good fit. And uh, so it's, I mean, it's just not an option. It's just that simple. Um, if you don't have high standards, and if you don't allow everybody to them, all of a sudden you don't have high standards. You know? So it's really important. Anyway, we really, we really believe it. We really mean it. And I pound it home, and we refer to it all the time. And it hangs up everywhere around the company. And while most people can't recite it uh, nearly like I can, they do know that it's there. And when someone's out of alignment with this vision, it's, it's very, very obvious. So <clears throat> commitment, res resilience, optimism, belief, standards, Continuing to dream. I hope you see there are actually some parallels between these two stories. So what questions do you have for these two entrepreneurs? Yes, sir. Nate Waters, without having the home front support that you needed, where did you find your values? Just as a it may seem strange, but when you ask a question, you're going to get a poker chip. <laughs> poker hold, on, chip. hold on to the poker chip. <laughs> but, uh, how much do you, uh, so the question was without having the support, uh, the home front, the uh, foundation uh, to build up your value system, how did you find the values? Well, it was kind of, uh, I guess, a buffet uh, table of uh, different, different experiences of different people you know, that I've been around in my life. Like, um, like there were some values that some of my friends' parents had that I pretty much adopted from them or 
you know, or a teacher, you know, or it's, so it's kind of like a collection of just different people that I that I've been around and watching how they how they carried themselves. For good example, um, how I became interested in real estate was because I looked kind of looked up to my my landlord, and he he always he had a high standard of how he carried himself. You know, and so I kind of looked at that and like, wow, this is something that I like. You know, so it's kind of a collection of just different, different people, different, um, you know, uh, situations. Yeah. Uh, I guess, you know, I guess aspects that I admired about them is kind of what I, you know, took as kind of a value or, you know, something that I, you know, emulated. Yes, ma'am. Was there one specific person that you looked up to that had those specific values? Um, I guess to be honest with you, um, no, it, it, it really wasn't. Um, it really wasn't. I, I know when I was a kid, you know, I, whenever, I knew I, I knew that if someone wasn't right because I'd have a father in the household. And then I was like, wow, okay, well. Maybe one of my mother's boyfriends could be somebody I looked up to and found out that's not the right way. So, yeah, it wasn't. No one in particular, to be honest with you. Just, yeah. Back in the back. Mr. Clark, you have, obviously you have an incredible uh, benign for making the restaurant business and food service go. And I know that you want to stay in Stillwater, that you have the ability to, to reach out, but that you to stay in Stillwater. Have you thought about using that expertise, that Vinash, for doing anything other than food business? Well, um, of course, we, we got into the retail business in 87, like I mentioned. I mean, we were in it in a big way before that, but I kind of didn't think about myself that way. And I kind of had an aha moment at some point after 87 and thought, wow, I'm a retailer. So I kind of started really studying that industry more. And then fast forward to 2002, we actually started our newest company. We call it Eskimo Joe's Promotional Products Group. And we literally are a promotional products supplier, distributor is what they actually call it in the channel. And uh, so we sell logo merchandise to companies of all types today. And so that's just another way where we, we're just taking kind of the creative spark, the, uh, the marketing expertise to create a brand out of a beer joint, and we're, we're out there selling that service to Oklahoma State University, for example, Bank First downtown, uh, Ditch Witch over Barry. I mean, you know, you could just, I can just name companies all around this region of the country now that we're serving in that capacity. And that will probably end up being the biggest company I've got because it's not uh, limited geographically at all, although it's based here in Stillwater. And we're leveraging. Uh, just kind of everything we've become over the last 36 years. It's really very exciting. And it's also, um, everything else I do is retail, and this is a direct selling business. So when I first got in it, it was just a whole new set of challenges. And uh, so it's been very stimulating for me personally, and I've actually poured a lot of my heart and soul into that for the last nine years. So that's a so, B2B as opposed to B2C. Absolutely, exactly. And, and on the clothes thing, you. I think I heard you say at one point you had four restaurants and the clothes were making more money than the... Yeah, in, in, our, in our peak of Joe's clothes, uh, at one point when I did have four restaurants before we closed Stillwater Bay, there was, there was a year in there where Eskimo Joe's clothes outgrossed all four of those bar restaurants combined. So just to give you a sense of the scale and the significance of the retail brand, it's really been, it's really been the best business I have five by a long ways, and still is today. Your um, Your brand and is very uh, national worldwide, and you talk about the growth and sent out the catalogs earlier. Yeah. What is it that made you want to um, want to stay in Stillwater with Eskimo Joe's and Mexico Joe's rather than step out and brand? So there's some values here in terms of this decision. Absolutely. You know, truly, my value was always I wanted Joe's to really be very unique and very, very special. And also, when you go back, you kind of almost have to go back to 75 and sort of understand we're just in the downstairs of that little stone building. I mean, we just, it was 
almost nothing except our energy and our passion, our enthusiasm for what we're doing. And you know, we had ice cold beer, but you know, that's not real hard to do. And, you know, we, we played great music. That was some of our personal taste coming through, but you know, that's kind of it. And to have grown it into something, there just came a time when I, I just thought, you know, there's never, there's no way it'll ever be like this again. And I just, I am just, I'm just married to it, you know, and I'm married to Stillwater and Oklahoma State, and I don't know, I just know we can never replicate it, it could never be the same. Doesn't mean it couldn't be good, and it certainly doesn't mean it would not be successful. I, I don't think, I mean, unless we just totally didn't execute, I, I do think it would be successful financially, but just kind of decided quite a while back that that just wasn't the ultimate objective. Um, what were the most challenging, what were some of the most challenging uh, things you had to deal with to first open the bar, Eskimo Joe's, as you were 22 years old? Well, of course getting a loan was a big deal. And uh, that's where the college business really came in handy. You know, we, we did pro forma statements and, and we created, uh, you know, projections of, ex of revenues and expenses. Of course, the revenue line is, is absolutely nothing but conjecture. You just got to, you know, hope and think that you know what you're thinking and <clears throat> that you might be right. But the expense lines, you could actually be somewhat empirical. You could call an insurance agent, for example, and find out what it would cost to insure that type of business in this many square feet. So a lot of the expenses we could really ascertain with some clarity. But again, the entrepreneurial spirit and the, the drive, and the, I think I can do it that an entrepreneur's got to have, you know, that's a, that's a crap sheet. I mean, that is an absolute guess. And so we did, we think for sure we could do this much and we like to think we can do that much. And if things were really good, it'd look more like that. So we did three different, you know, assumed volume levels. I've still got the, what I took to Stillwater National Bank in, in a file. And I could, I could go find it in two seconds. And uh, it's almost comical as I look back on it. I don't think I'd have gotten a very good grade at, in the College of Business for it. <laughs> but, but, you know, hey, we got the love. So I guess, it was, I guess it was good enough in the real world. But uh, at any rate, you know, that's, that was probably the biggest hurdle. There uh, had to be some values, too, in the early days. And it's cash business. So it's easy for two guys to take cash out of the business if you weren't. No, we, we needed the money to, to pay the loan. <laughs> you know, there wasn't any doubt. It all needed to go to the bank. So, um, you know, that was, that was no problem. And interestingly, we were most of the labor, and we didn't pay ourselves at all. We didn't take a salary. We didn't pay ourselves by the hour. Pardon me, but if there was cash in the bank, you know, it was ours. And so if we needed it, we just took it. And they call that a draw, you know, and that's just the way you do it in a proprietorship, or in that case, a partnership. And uh, so, you know, we were able to, we were able to get along, do well enough. We were in, we were in business for about two weeks. And there's a guy living upstairs. And, you know, of course, just thumping downstairs. And so we drove him out real quickly. He just, that was an unacceptable living environment. And I can understand why. And for a short time, Steve and I actually lived upstairs. So if you can imagine uh, upstairs in the inside, we call it up in, but anyway, you know, the original stone building in the upstairs park, there's a window on the north kind of east side. And I had a mattress on the floor right there. And that's where I slept for about two months. And that was pretty handy to have a bar right downstairs. And just cruise upstairs. You know, what I kind of liked it. But, and Steve and I shared the one bathroom there was upstairs. And he slept on the other side of that big horseshoe-shaped bar. He was on the south side of that bar. And so anyway, I mean, this is just all stuff that just comes back to me as I'm sitting here in front of you guys. But, you know, it was, it was. It was a crazy place. And then we realized very soon thereafter, we need, we need to find another place to live. We need to expand this place. So we expanded into the upstairs by the fall of 75. In fact, we got open in time for the OU game uh, that year. And that was good. That was a big day, that was a big day for us. Yes, ma'am. This is for Mr. Waters. Um, you talked about how you've always had like a dream growing up of like you were always on to the next thing. So where do you see yourself in 10 years? Like, what would you well, I, I definitely see myself, um, you know, doing very successful with the global venture capital and private equity firm. You know, because um, 
I mean, entrepreneurship is global. And, um, you know, and case in point, you know, like the micro lending, you know, endeavors in India, places like that. So I definitely see myself, you know, really doing very good with that. And also um, encouraging philanthropy amongst, amongst young people. You know, because I know the baby boomers, they were very generous. Um, and the generation before them, you know, involved in philanthropy as far as giving to different nonprofits and different causes. And I see nowadays, it's, uh, it's not a lot of, there's not a large amount of young people you know, I'm young too, just like you guys. I mean, that you know, that are involved in charitable causes, you know. And so I want to, you know, get, I want to become, become more involved with that and encourage more young people to get to give back. You know, that, that's how we keep this thing going, you know. That's how we keep this uh, society going, it's by, you know, having a giving heart. And I know I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for people that, you know, that have given me a chance and have given me opportunity, you know, and um, so I, I, you know, I think that's very important. Tracy? Um, were either one of you ever tempted along the way to do something to help you get ahead that went against your values? Well, I, I know in Chicago, um, you know, in Chicago, you know, there's, you know, very aggressive game um, culture up there. And you know, guys would approach me all the time about joining, you know, the local street gang and how much money I would make selling drugs and stuff like that, you know. And I just I didn't want any part of it, you know. I, and it's dead. And I look back on it like, you know, like I think the fellow was saying about different values you come up with at home and everything. And I and I really can't attribute that to anything that I got from home of, of not wanting to be involved in that type of lifestyle. It's just something that I didn't want to do, you know, because I, I knew that it wasn't right. So that's kind of an innate, an innate set of values, you know, that I had. I'm glad I didn't get involved, because I probably would have been dead or, you know, you know, in prison or something like that, you know. No question. You know, I've compromised my values, I, you know, I, a, a bunch. <laughs> you know, I mean, I'm just a guy. I'm just a guy. Um, it's great to get a little older and think you're a little wiser and uh, reflect on things. Uh, but no, I, I'd have to say at age 22, I made all kinds of, of you know, silly mistakes. And I certainly made a lot of them before I was age 22, you know, um, just in high school. And, and, even in college, you know, I just feel like I'm lucky I'm even alive, frankly, uh, for, for lots of silly mistakes. But when it comes to the way to do business, uh, now I actually, I'm actually pretty proud. I never feel like I, I ever took advantage of a person or did anything that was, that was just really um, a bad choice in that regard. And so I, if I am proud of the way we conducted ourselves, it is, I am proud of the way we've treated people, be it our employees, or be it our suppliers, or be it, uh, you know, or serving our customers. So, you know, I, I really, those are kind of more of the things that I have to look at. I've made some bad life choices, you know, as man. Coming here tonight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, I have a question about the Chicago Board of Trade. Um, I was just wondering if, um, well, thinking of all of your um, restaurants, the fact that we're in a college town and all of your employees are, are more likely going to be college students. Have there ever been any problems of the turnover rate or the fact that there's only college, college students working at your businesses? It's, uh, it's the biggest blessing that I have is that you guys are such awesome, awesome folks to draw from and to get to try to mold and get the flow uh, into this business right there's no doubt about it. It's the greatest piece of doing business here is, is OSU students. Now, is the turnover rate bad? Yes. It's horrific. And, uh, be, and it's not because we're a bad place to work. It's be just the nature of you guys, you know, and you're coming and you're going. And so, um, probably on average, we have about 500 employees right now. And in, in, the, in one year, I know we sent out 1,300 W-2s. 
So it takes 1,300 people to have an average of 500. What is that? You know, 260 percent of turn, or you know, I don't know, depends on you know what you use as your, I guess, the denominator or whatever. But so we have a lot of turn. Um, it was better last year. It was just under a thousand, I think, last year. So that's pretty good. But it's just it's just part of it. We're constantly training. Um, I mentioned Smiles 101, that's our, that's, I think I did anyway, but maybe not by name, but that's our orientation. Um, I do that about every three weeks, all year long. And, you know, for the last several, have been 40 or more in every one of them. <laughs> so, you know, we've, we've got 100 and, what is that, that's at least 160, you know, new folks since, um, since school was out of May, I know, that have come through. So it's, it's just, it's just part of it. But, uh, but here's the good news. What we really need is a great attitude. And you all have the aptitude. I mean, you've got to be so smart to get in Oklahoma State. You know, I'm not sure I could be an OSU student today. <laughs> Fortunately, I was good enough to get in in 75. But, uh, you know, you guys are really, really smart. So with a great attitude, it doesn't take very long to train the technical skills uh, if you've got the right attitude to work. So did you say you do the smiles? Smiles 101 I did for all of our results. I did personally. That'd be easy to delegate, but you don't. Well, you know, when we first came up with the idea, I didn't do it. And uh, and we had some turnover in the public relations department, the public relations director. And I thought to myself, you know, this is my story. I need to be the one that's communicating this. I've been doing this for I don't know, probably 15 years. So that's a value in and of itself. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes, Christy. Uh, going back to what Mr. Waters said about um, giving back and philanthropy, um, we heard that you were involved in United Way, and so I'm wondering um, how important was it for you to um, be involved in the Stoller community and add that social component to your business? Because we do see some businesses adding a social component just as a mere strategy to gain customers and increase the bottom line. So what was your motivation for getting involved? Well, fortunately, I uh, was surrounded by people much wiser than me when you start at 22. You know, you're bound to be people around you that are a lot smarter. And so I got engaged pretty darn quickly. Um, just the beer distributor was a mentor and, and said, hey, you need to get involved. Uh, the bankers certainly were modeling that and, and recommending that. The June Joint Job will be, I think this, this falls our 24th. And the year before that, so 25 years ago, the Stillwater Area United Way decided to start a run. And they called it the Power of Love Run. And there was a, there was a hit song out by Huey Lewis at the time, Power of Love. And so at the end of the run, it ended at Joe's, and we were right in the middle of it, and we helped with it and volunteered with it. <clears throat> the then director of the United Way asked, hey, Stan, would you put your name on this run? And would you help me do it? And I said, absolutely, I'd be honored to do it. Let's, let's think about it. I called a good friend of mine and said, Clyde, help me think of a name for, for a run. And it, it, it took him five minutes. He called me back and said, well, how about the juke joint jog? And I just fell out of my chair laughing and said, that's it. That's great. That's perfect. But uh, so anyway, 20, this was 24 years ago. I, I won't say that we did it um, to, to add to the bottom line or whatever. What I will say is we've been a good corporate citizen for a long time. And I do think it matters, especially in a small town. I remember in Macroecon, they talked about how in business you're in a glass house. And people see everything you do, you know. And that was just a little too uh, theoretical to me back then. And I, I kind of didn't really get the metaphor. After doing business and for 36 years in a small town, I really get it. They do notice it. So I think the things that we've done that have served the community are, they're, the, they're more important than any promotion we ever bring up. You know, it's just who we are. So again, back to values. It's just there's not a more important one, and I'm very proud of our of our record of philanthropy and just doing what we could, where we could. Um, I'll share another one. Back in 1998, when we were just finishing our big screen printing facility that's up by the airport on Air, um, Land Run Road. Um, First job we printed in there was, was a co-branded shirt with uh, Special Olympics of Oklahoma. The Special Olympics have their summer games here, and it's just an unbelievable week. Uh, some of you may not have ever been here that week of May, because it's the week after everybody graduates and leaves. But here come the Special Olympics, and there's 
probably 12, 15,000 people all together that come to town. Over 4,000 athletes participate. And there's typically at least a coach and some family members with every athlete. So it's a really big deal. And uh, we just called them and said, look, you help us so much, we want to help you. So we came up with this idea of a co-branded shirt. We've done it every year since 1998. And we've given Special Olympics of Oklahoma, you know, I don't even know the exact number, but tens of thousands of dollars, probably approaching $100,000 off of the sales of those shirts. And so it's a way to leverage our brand's popularity for basically a greater good. And so we've been doing uh, pink ribbon stuff and giving to Project Woman is another example. College of Education came to us five years ago. There's now an endowed scholarship in the College of Education, the Eskimo Joe's Future Teacher Scholarship. And we've given the same amount to the Stillwater Public Education Foundation over those five years. So, I mean, I could just go on and on. I'm not here to pat myself on the back. I'm just saying it's exciting to be able to leverage what we've done to really help others. And so we're real proud of it. And not only is it important to me, it's important to all the people working on the company. It's really a big deal. So, again, back to values. It's just, you know, it really comes from here. And, uh, I'm proud, of, you know, I'm really excited for what we're able to do. A couple more questions. Yes, sir. I have a question on, uh, in terms of ethics and values, do you think that your, the more that you go through in life, that your values are constantly shifting, or do you find that you have a, once you reach a certain, a certain point, that you have your uh, value system sort of built in the stem? You know what, yeah, I, 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 you know, I definitely think that as a person evolves within himself, that that their ethics and uh, values you know, can shift. I mean, um, I mean, like case in point, you look at you know some of the failures of different companies, you know, publicly traded companies like Enron, Lehman Brothers, and companies like that. You kind of, you kind of, you kind of ask the question like, "Wow, you know, these guys are just looting these companies, you know." And so, but then you can also think on another one. Like, okay, you can think that well, they, they may be greedy or something, but but then, then on the other hand, if a person has made it, has accomplished so much success that they may not be willing to do some of the things they did at the beginning. So it's kind of like looking at it the other way around. So yeah, I, I, I think as I became older and uh, and uh, have have been exposed to more things, and I, I think that it definitely has you know uh, gave a positive impact on my life and, and ethics and everything like that. Yeah, I, I, I absolutely yeah continue to to be formed. I think by everything that happens to you. But in contrast to that, I think back on uh, studying the seven habits of highly effective people, which is something that I went through countless times. And one of Covey's principles is to learn something deeply, teach it. Because to teach, you got to really know it and believe it. And so, and so I went through that process on several different times. And the thing I liked about Covey's stuff is, is he talks about timeless principles and things that don't really change. So. You know, I think we continue to change, but principles are pretty solid, you know, and so they're kind of there. I remember one quote uh, by Cecil D. B. DeMille out of the movie The Ten Commandments it goes something like this. I'll have to paraphrase it, but, you know, um, we, can't, we can't change the laws. We can only break ourselves against the laws. And so, you know, the principles are steadfast. We kind of choose sometimes to, you know, we, you know, we may or may not really hold true maybe what may be what we believe. Um, and I just, I just think, you know, the more you, the more you grow, the more you learn, and the more you have time to reflect and all that stuff. And uh, so I, I don't, I, I do think probably they continue to evolve, but I'd like to think they've been in a pretty good place for a long time. But uh, it's, it's a very deep and wonderful question. Um, you stated that you, this is for Mr. Clark, you stated that you have values concerning the customers and employees that you're very proud of. But in the business world, 
what values do you see in relation to your competitors? How should, if I was to start a business, how should I treat my competitors? That's a good question. You know, um, I know when I first started, I was real closed, you know, and I mean, it's just me, and I'm not going to tell anybody what I'm doing, and everything's a secret. And then over time, you know, I got involved in the Oklahoma Restaurant Association and realized, holy cow, you know, there's all these, these are great people, and they got the same issues I've got. There's so much we can learn from one another. So, I don't know, I think that's one that really evolved for me over time. Um, now, professional trade associations are just tremendous resources to us, uh, be it the Promotional Products Association International, PPAI, or uh, the Oklahoma Restaurant Association and National Restaurant Association. Um, so I kind of, I really do view it a lot differently. The other thing is that, that I really preach is to never, never badmouth the competition. I think by doing so, we only belittle ourselves. And so we never talk negatively about a competitor. And uh, you know, we can't control what the competitor does anyway. All we can control is what we do and what attitude we're going to choose towards whatever else is going on around us. And so um, you know, I, uh, that's really that last comment is all I'd really say. I mean, you know, of course you want to beat them. And you, you want the customer. And you want the customer's loyalty and the customer's repeat business and all of that. But, there's, there's a lot of business to go around and, you know, it's just important to me that we treat everybody well, uh, that we work with, be it our, uh, you know, ourselves and our, our suppliers and our customers and, uh, and, you know, other than that, I just don't kind of go there, if you will. Of course, that, that, that's with the exception of the, when OU is the competitor, right? <laughs> <laughs> you had a question back there? Uh, yeah, and you were saying you were going with Mexico Joe's that you were literally taking cash advances to meet payroll. Yes, sir. Um, what are some of the key elements you use to actually take the negative taste per se or to say out of people's mouth to come back to your restaurant? Oh, that's an excellent question. You know, the first thing was we got rough. We began to really execute the plan. The recipes were delicious. They were outstanding. The food product was good. Um, but, you know, again, we just, we made, we just made some horrific mistakes, just wonders of it. Of, uh, you know, just long tickets and, you know, just undertrained, just poor execution. Um, one of the things we did really was a marketing ploy, and at that point in uh, time, local avails became available on some of the early cable television networks like ESPN and MTV. So we started doing some local cable television advertising, and I basically just stood there and said, it's the first time I ever positioned our guarantee. And our guarantee had been that forever and still is that today. And that is that if it's not great, it's on me. I'll buy it. It's free. And I said, if this isn't the best Mexican food you've ever had, I'll buy it. And I remember the guy I was buying the ads from, he must not have thought our food was that good because he said, Clark, are you sure you want to say that? <laughs> but, you know, we barely bought any meals, but it was a bold positioning statement. And it began to sink, and we did believe in it, and it was good. And, and like I said, in '88 we got it turned around. But that was a slow, grueling process and a very expensive lesson learned. You know, great question. Yes. Do we get the last question? Well, my question is from Mr. Uh Like our world today, it's becoming more and more globalized. <coughs> Companies they're starting to hire people from different cultural backgrounds and they come with different values. So how can you integrate this great differences in values and culture into your company without upsetting your organizations, your employees, or your own values? Well, it's just a, it's a fantastic question and probably beyond my pay grade, to be honest. <laughs> um, you know, I, I don't know. I will say this, we value diversity. I'll just, I'll quote. Value each team member as an individual and profit from diversity. So we address it. How I actually live it, I don't know. I mean, I, do, I, don't, have a, I don't have an honest question how I've really thought that through. Um, I know we don't discriminate. We, we look at anybody that walks in and wants to come to work. Um, you know, some things you have to do. 
in all three areas with all three constituents, you have to exude an attitude of enthusiasm in everything you do, or you can't work here. You just can't. If you're not upbeat about it, how can you hope to make someone else want to be there? And it's everybody's job to make our customers want to be there. So, you know, I, I'm, getting off, I'm getting off the question. I, I, I'm afraid I don't have a great answer to it. Um, I don't know. But I know we're open. We're open to everybody. And uh, then, you know, if the values would be conflicting or something, in all candor, if you can't do this, you probably wouldn't be a Fed. And we probably, it probably wouldn't work out. So, you know, I guess the person would have to be flexible enough to, to take on our values, or candidly, I don't know it to you, probably, to figure out how to employ you, because it is my company. And in Oklahoma, it's an at-will employment state, which means anybody can be let go anytime without cause. That's the law in Oklahoma. And we don't do that very often, but if we need to, you know. And, and in all candor, a guy like me, I'm very sensitive. I love people. You know, I had to learn the hard lesson of when it's time to terminate somebody, stop talking. You know, I want to tell them, oh, but you're a great guy, and I'd love to do this and that and the other way. <laughs> <laughs> you know, attorneys are going, stop, stop, stop. So, you know, sometimes you have to just kind of let it be what it is. So, host team, did we learn anything tonight? Yes. Um, I just mentioned five, uh, five lessons we've learned from each, uh, each speaker. And the first one was from Nate Waters, is understand your self-worth. Uh, the second one is the importance of networking and connecting with the right people. The third is we should dream and keep dreaming even when those dreams look shattered. Um, we sh the fourth one is the importance of healthy dissatisfaction. That attitude of always saying, I can do better despite my current situation. And the fifth one is to find your value sources and adopt them. And these sources can be from anywhere, but just discern them and uh, make them your own personal fit. Then, uh, Mr. Stan Clark, the first one is uh, create strong connections and processes within the company uh, for employees to have a shared value system. Uh, the second one is values are nurtured, hence expose yourself to the right environments to be nurtured to the right and correct things. The third one was to value your customers and your relationships and have the passion of delighting those customers, um, relationships, and employees. The fourth one is create good standards and value, and, and make sure that those standards are not a widely spread throughout your organization for consistency purposes. And the fifth one is there are going to be hard times and hard moments, but your values that you hold close to you are the ones that will sustain you for a long time. Those are some of the lessons we, we took down. And with that, Josh will present. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. So please join me.